it's time for us to check back in with Dory, Woman of the Mountains, and see what happens next. If you missed the previous videos, the previous readings, you can look in the description below for a playlist. Signs of fall were all around us now, and with the changing of the seasons, election time was coming. Fred had always encouraged me to vote. He took me to Tremont to register and pay the poll tax. It was a presidential election year, and Fred wanted us to hear all the speeches. He ordered a battery radio from Sears. Everybody went to Tremont to vote and came back to our house that night to hear the results. We had the only radio on the job. The house and yard were full of people, Democrats and Republicans, each sure if their candidate didn't win, the world was doomed. Warren G. Harding was the first man I voted for, Calvin Coolidge the next. This time I voted for Herbert Hoover. Every man I had voted for won the presidency, a pretty good average for a beginner, I thought. However, I was not so lucky with my votes for many years after that. Fred finished his studies with Cones Electric School and took his new knowledge to Knoxville in search of a job. The lumber business was being phased out and the men were leaving the mountains. The Tennessee Public Service Company hired him. They were building a power line from Knoxville to Waterville, North Carolina. He would have to stay on the job all week and come home on the weekends. Wilma and Paul were ready for high school, so we were going to have to move where schooling was available. Pittman Center was the nearest place. Fred went to Pittman to find a house. He rented a small white house and hired a man with a truck to come back with him and move us. The house was much better than the one we were living in on the job. The sitting room had a fireplace, and when we were settled and everything was in place, Fred went to Waterville to begin his new work. Pittman Center is back to back with the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Many mountaineers had sold their land to the government and moved to Pittman. The increased population showed up in the schools. For the first time, my children went to different schools instead of all being together in one room. Edith and Charles went to Pittman Grammar School while Paul and Wilma attended the high school. Hot lunches were served at the school and it had a good library. Pittman School had been the project of the Methodist Board of Home Missions. Dr. Robert Thomas had come into the area as a medical missionary years before. The school and clinic had been built with Methodist money and mountaineer muscle. He and his wife cared for the sick in the clinic and made house calls into the deep hollows and coves. After Fred went to Waterville, the children and I took care of each other. We had never been without Fred, except the time I had left him alone in El Dorado and the week he visited his family in North Carolina. The library supplied us with enough books to read. On cool days, we kept a little fire in the fireplace. I baked bread in a Dutch oven on the hearth and cooked beans in a kettle over the fire, the way Ma cooked in O'Connell Lufty before she got a stove. We had a stove, but it was fun sitting around the fire waiting for supper. In the larger schools, the children were exposed to more sickness. Colds and sore throats plagued us all fall. Edith became very sick with a cough and a fever. I told Paul to go by Dr. Thomas's office and ask him to come by to see her. In the afternoon, I answered a knock at the door and saw a tall, gentle-looking man smiling at me. He examined Edith and turned to me. He wanted to examine me because I was very pregnant and very tired. I wasn't used to having medical attention before I gave birth. He told me I had an enlarged heart and should be very careful. In fact, I shouldn't even be out of bed. I was scared to death. What would become of my children if something happened to me? I had always asked God to let me live until they didn't need me anymore. It was unthinkable that they might have a stepmother. At first, I stayed in bed all I could with five children to care for. As time passed and I felt everything was going to be all right, I didn't stay in bed anymore. Dr. Thomas made regular visits to see me. We lived on a hill and could see him when he started up the trail. Before he got to the door, I'd go get into bed and try to look comfortable and rested when he come in. He thought I was a good patient and following his orders. The months passed and Fred's job in Waterville was almost over. He said the company wanted him to go to Memphis to finish work there. 
He came home to get us ready to move, but I didn't want to go. I was in the last stages of pregnancy, and Dr. Thomas's warning about my heart hung like a dark cloud over my head. After much discussion, we decided he would go alone. So he left, not knowing when he would come back home. There was no choice. He had to go where he could earn a living. It was a blessing that we didn't go with him. The job lasted a little over three months. We hadn't been able to save any money. He had to pay room and board there, and I had to maintain a home for five children here. When he got back to Knoxville, he learned that there was no more work for anyone. He was laid off. The depression was tightening its grip on the country. Things were to get much worse before they got better. Fred's brother Harry came looking for work. Together they went begging for anything to do. Harry was a good-natured man who talked a blue streak. He liked to stay at our house because he said it was the only place he could get three hot meals a day. Harry, the children called him Uncle Fuzz, was shocked when he saw Wayne in light brown curls hanging to his shoulders. He was sure we had ruined him for life, doomed him to sissyhood. Three years old and he still looked like a girl. Wilma and Edith wouldn't let anyone touch his head of bouncy curls, but Harry won out. He took Wayne for a walk, and when he came back, there wasn't a curl to be seen. His beautiful hair was cropped and uneven all over his head. The girls were furious. Of course, they couldn't be disrespectful to their uncle, but if looks could kill, he would be dead. Wayne just smiled and didn't seem to care either way. He was a bright child who sang all the time. His sister's attention had helped him talk before he was a year old. He knew all the words to the hymns we sang. His small, clear voice drifted from wherever he happened to be, playing alone. But he never seemed alone. His ears rang with music only he could hear. He loved peach pie and roasting ears, baked corn on the cob, more than anything. He seemingly disappeared one afternoon, and we hunted and called for him for what seemed like hours. Paul said, if he's in here in distance, I know what to do. He started calling, Wayne, do you want a roast in here? A sleepy scamp came crawling out from under a bed where we thought we'd already searched. He was fighting mad when he didn't get his corn. When we had peach pie, he usually got more than his share. Aunt Sally Bright was coming for supper and I made a cobbler pie. Wayne sat looking at Aunt Sally and then at the pie. After mentally measuring the servants, he knew he wouldn't get his usual generous amount. He looked up at Aunt Sally and said in a firm voice, You don't like peach pie, do you? It wasn't a question, it was a warning. Aunt Sally had a good sense of humor. She laughed and wasn't offended. On April 24th, 1930, I woke with a very familiar feeling the baby was coming. Fred went to Dr. Thomas's office and asked him to come and help me. The doctor had asked to be called as soon as my labor started. He wanted to watch my progress and save my heart from too much stress. When it was time, he put a mask over my face and poured drops of ether into the gauze. The strong burning odor seemed to reach every nerve in my body. My head felt light and wobbly. I drifted off to sleep. My son Dwight Arnold was born as I floated on downy clouds. This beautiful child came without the discomfort that has been woman's lot since Eve. I never had been treated with such kindness and concern. Mrs. Eva Thomas, the doctor's wife, came every day to bathe me and the baby. She brought food and changed my bed linen. She taught me to cook several new dishes. The one I remember most is Spanish rice. Dr. Thomas brought material to make a crib. Students in the high school workshop class had cut it out, ready to be put together. Paul made it and painted it white. I folded one of my heaviest quilts to use as a mattress. My first and only baby crib stood beside my bed, white and lovely, while my tiny red-faced son slept like a kitten in the middle. No work was available anywhere, and our money had disappeared long ago. The food on our pantry shelves was going fast, in spite of our attempts to make it last as long as possible. 
Fred hunted small game to keep meat on the table. Our 20-gallon crock of pickled corn was gone. A few bundles of leather breeches, dried green beans, hung from the ceiling. All the flat land, or what we called bottom land, from Pittman Center to Newport was used to grow beans and tomatoes for the big Stokely Brothers cannery in Newport. They canned their produce in tin cans, cans we couldn't afford to buy. One fall afternoon, during Paul's youthful, restless wanderings, he found tomatoes in the tall grass around the cannery fields. They were under the thick covering of grass that had fallen and protected them from the killing frost which left the ones in the fields inedible. He stuffed his shirt full and came home with his bounty. We had fried green tomatoes, stewed tomatoes, tomatoes with biscuits, and tomatoes we ate whole like apples. They were the best tasting tomatoes I ever had in my whole life. We were at our lowest ebb. Never had we been so close to starvation. Of course, we were not alone. The whole world seemed to stand still. No work, no money, and very little hope. Wilma worked for Dr. and Mrs. Thompson a few days a week. She helped do the laundry and household chores. Her pay was small, but it was better than nothing. We were all tired. The girls never complained about their old clothes. We all ate less. The saddest of all was that we almost forgot how to laugh. Our house always rang with laughter over minor silly things. When one funny bone was tickled, we all dissolved into uncontrollable hilarity. Now I couldn't remember when laughter had last filled our house. Worry and work left me ill. Dr. Thomas came, knowing he would not be paid for his work. After examining me, he took Fred outside and told him I was very sick. I was anemic, and my heart was enlarged and overworked. He said I'd probably be dead in three months. Those three remaining months would have to be spent in bed. Not knowing what to do, Fred wrote Ma in Tremont and for the first time asked for her advice. She told him to bring me home. We could move in with them until a house was ready for us. It was doubtful that the lumber company would hire Fred since their business was at a standstill too. Ma said the new company doctor, Edward W. Griffin, was well liked and she had much faith in him. Dr. Montgomery had already moved to Gatlinburg and opened an office there. I had not seen the last of this man who had been so much a part of our lives. So many of my years had been spent in and near Tremont, I really felt I was coming home, but not to die. Dear Lord, I couldn't go and leave my babies. I prayed without ceasing, pleading for my life. Dr. Griffin came to see me after Fred went to his office and told him I was sick. I was very anemic, and indeed my heart was enlarged, but could it be heredity? The first thing he wanted me to do was eat properly and have a drink of brandy twice a day to build up my strength. We went to Maryville for a bottle of brandy. It was expensive, and I felt a waste. Fred became a moonshiner temporarily. He found a recipe for peach brandy and made a batch. We had plenty of free advice and offers to taste our brew. I never drank the brandy. My puritanical background convinced me that it was sinful and that surely God would heal me without the peach spirits. Slowly, my health improved. Being in my beloved mountains among friends and relatives gave me courage. Everything was familiar here. We were soon settled into a routine, almost as if we'd never been away from the logging camps. Many of the people were gone, and only a few isolated cuttings were being done. Most of the work was on the tracks and in the railroad shop. Ernest and Bernice Hedrick still ran the hotel. Fred went into the company office to ask about work. They weren't hiring anybody. The operation was being slowly closed down. As he left the office, he met D.H. Doc Tipton. Mr. Tipton had always been a good friend. He asked Fred what he was doing back in Tremont. Looking for a job, Fred said, but they won't hire me. Go back in there and tell them I said to put you to work, Mr. Tipton told him. Fred got the job. He went to work with Pa, maintaining the railroad. Pa's time books list a crew of 25 for October 1931 when Fred started to work. The November crew was cut to six men. 
From then until 1935, only six to 10 people were listed. Fred stayed on the payroll for four months. In March 1932, the Tennessee Electric Power Company called him back to build power lines between Sevierville and Gatlinburg. All my family lived in a row, Am and Lola, Luther and Willie, Pa and Ma with us. Our house was the last one near the river across from Buckeye Flats. The school was behind us about halfway between the river and the railroad. Am Townsend teased my children unmercifully. They loved every minute of it. Even in the coldest weather, he'd say to one of them, if you'll come over to my house, we'll cut a watermelon. The older ones knew he was teasing, but the younger ones followed him home only to be told, oh, we're too late, somebody else ate it. On one of his trips to Elkmont, he brought back two rabbits. He gave Paul a black one and Charles a gray one. The gray one got out and never came back. The black one stayed and ruled the whole house. We never gave him a name. He was just Rabbit. He came and went as he pleased. The cats scattered when he came in the door. There wasn't one of them that didn't have scars from his strong hind feet. Rabbit had his own place at the table and his own tin plate. He'd stand or sit on his hind feet in a chair and eat out of the plate on the table. The smell of supper brought him in from distant hideouts. Huckleberry pie drove him into a frenzy. Afterwards, he'd lick his paws until all the evidence of his greediness was gone. Everybody knew and loved him, and I suppose coveted him as a pet. People were moving out of the mountains, and we think someone took Rabbit with them when they left camp. We never found him. When we heard anything that sounded like the familiar scratches at the door, we ran to open it, only to be disappointed. The rabbit was only one of many pets in the family. Ma had a small dog, Fanny, which killed every snake she could find. We saw her many times in a life and death battle with a thrashing, hissing serpent. She had the uncanny ability to know how far a snake could strike. She'd stay far enough away to escape the fangs and grab it before it could coil and strike again. We also had a frustrated sheepdog. He was excellent at rounding up the cows and bringing them home. There was one problem. He'd get the time mixed up and bring them home in the middle of the day. We herded them back to the open pasture and wondered how we could teach a dog to tell time. We had to keep a careful eye on our cattle. Bears were a problem, but the railroad cars caused more damage. When the work trains caused damage, we accepted that as part of the job hazards. The company's fancy Chrysler runabout convertible, which had been mounted on the railroad tracks, was a different story. It was used to transport important guests to and from the Tremont Hotel. Out-of-state company officials and their ladies were frequent visitors along with the wealthy investors from Knoxville. Our feelings toward the hotel were not helped any when the car hit our only young heifer, Snowball. The loss of a milk cow is a great loss to a family that cannot afford to replace her. Snowball's mother, Old Nell, had died giving birth to her. Fred had even persuaded Dr. Montgomery to come and see if he could do anything to save Old Nell or the baby. Dr. Montgomery's medical knowledge didn't cover bovine anatomy and the mother died. Snowball was very white and pink. Ma said she was an albino. We mixed cornmeal with milk donated by the neighbors and took turns feeding the little calf 24 hours a day. When she was old enough to eat on her own, we thought we had reached a milestone, but we discovered that Snowball had other problems too. She was stone deaf. Months of worry had gone into raising Snowball to where she was almost ready to have her first calf and provide us with much needed milk for the children. Neighbors had been sharing their milk and butter with us. We were grateful for their generosity, but with Snowball, we had hopes of coming off the dole. On one of its weekend excursions about a mile below the hotel, the Chrysler hit Snowball. She couldn't hear the car horn and didn't move off the tracks. The car wouldn't stop for her. Her leg was broken. Everybody told Ma the little calf would have to be killed, but Ma wouldn't hear of it. She looked around for two strong trees. As luck would have it, the ones she needed were just feet away from the railroad track. 
the calf would hardly have to be moved at all. Ma went to the railroad repair shop and got several wide leather strips and two chains. She made a harness for the calf and with the help of four men lifting the frightened beast, fastened the harness on the calf and the chains around the trees. Snowball was suspended between the trees and swayed back and forth while Ma put splints on her broken leg. The heifer stayed there six weeks with Ma and all of us taking turns feeding her. Ma still had a mind of her own, and it did no good to tell her that something couldn't be done. To tell her that was akin to waving a red flag in front of an angry bull. The company never gave us compensation for the damage done to any of our livestock. Their feeling was the same about Snowball. We should keep her off the track. Our attitude toward the hotel and the Chrysler changed to hostility. We had maintained an aloof indifference to the glowing white-coated building until now. The Tremont Hotel was situated across the railroad, embedded into the side of the mountain. The front porch was placed so the visitors had the best possible view of the river and the mountains. The Tremont settlement with its boxcar, portable housing, and work sheds was out of visual range of the hotel guests. Settlement people knew the hotel was off limits to them. But that was all right. Mountaineers wouldn't go any place they didn't feel welcome. They understood that the rich were different. That was a part of life they couldn't change. By now, most were aware of the differences between the two classes. Many of them had lived near the Wonderland Hotel in Elkmont where the same system worked. The Wonderland was a place to wonder about and view with some envy as the ladies from Knoxville and other faraway cities sat on the front porch in their finery and daintily fanned the gnats and flies away from their perfumed painted faces. The rumors and stories of what went on in the hotels kept the natives entertained. Some thought of them as the Sodom and Gomorrah of the mountains. A few local girls were employed as maids at both hotels. Pretty young daughters were warned to stay away from those places. Charles came in one day and announced that he had eaten lunch at the hotel. Always the one ready for a new adventure, I believed he had done exactly that. It turned out that Eula Broom had taken him over there to eat because he had forgotten to take his lunch to school. Mrs. Broom sometimes went to the hotel to eat her lunch while the children in her school were on their own lunch break. We didn't hold grudges against those who could go to the hotels. In fact, D.H. Tipton came to our rescue many times when we needed help and didn't know where to get it. He arranged for Edith and me to have medical attention at the Acuff Clinic in Knoxville. Edith had a strange brown spot on her eye. Dr. Griffin thought it might be cancer and he wanted her to have special attention. Mr. Tipton drove Fred and Edith to Knoxville and waited until they were ready to come home. Another time, he took Fred and me to the clinic when I needed surgery on my leg. Doc was a good man who was always ready to go the extra mile with people who needed him. This part of the book wasn't quite as exciting as some of the other parts has been, but still very interesting. Uh, she got to meet a new doctor, <laughs> Dr. Montgomery, with his uh, bad bedside manner. Now, you know, he was replaced by Dr. Thompson, who actually uh, made her feel better when she was having, having the baby, and then also told her about her enlarged heart. Makes you wonder how Dr. Montgomery missed that all those years, or maybe it had just developed, who knows. Um, but so that was interesting that they got to meet a, a different doctor. I really enjoyed the part about Paul finding the tomatoes. You can just imagine uh, kind of being hungry and worrying about food and then finding a windfall like that, finding a treasure where that they, you know, the tomatoes that were kind of forgotten by the side of the fields. Um, I remember I used to work with a lady and of course not being hungry like Dory's family was, but her, her uncle, he grew big fields like that of tomatoes, but also of peppers. And then after he was done for the season and there was some still there, he would let her family go and, and, you know, and pick what was left. And one time she asked me if I wanted some. I said, oh yes, I'd love it. And I remember she brought me the biggest, prettiest red peppers. Oh, they were just beautiful. And I was so excited to get them. So I can just imagine uh, how excited Dory and her family were over the tomatoes Paul found, especially since they were hungry. 
I enjoyed the part about all the pets too. Now that was some kind of pet rabbit. I don't know about letting a pet rabbit eat at my kitchen table up on its hind feet, but that was really interesting. Um, and then the other dogs, the, uh, her mother's dog there. And then the cow at the end, you know, terrible getting hurt on the train tracks there. But again, Dory's mother, she wouldn't give up. She got the men and organized them and uh, got them to build the sling there and, and put the cow in it so that they could take care of it and so its leg could heal. Um, again, Dory's mother to the rescue for sure. This last little part where she's talking about the hotel, that kind of really, I don't know, I, I really can um, understand, I guess, what she was talking about. So many times in a place, a really rural place, and I'm sure this doesn't just happen in Appalachia, it probably happens in other places, but I can only speak to my experiences here in Appalachia where I live. It's kind of like uh, you want people to come. You believe people should be able to go wherever they want to go. And if they want to move to your area, they should move. And a lot of times they bring industry and, and they bring, uh, you know, they bring jobs because if, it's, if houses are being built for them, then that gives the sheetrocker down the road a job and the plumber over the mountain. So there's all those things. But sometimes, some of the, and not all, there's been lots of people that moved to my area of Appalachia that are wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But there are an element of people that sometimes move to your hometown, wherever you live, your locale, that do kind of look down on you. And, and al along with that kind of looking down on you, a lot of times it seems like people move and then they, you know, then they live there a little while and not, it's like I'm saying, no, of course they should be able to say what they would like for, you know how they want things to go but a lot of times it's like it, they come from somewhere else and then they want to change where we at where we're at you know they want to change where they move to to be more like where they left i guess is what we're saying um, so a lot of times that kind of natives as uh, dory was calling them kind of rubs them the wrong way but most of the time they go about their way with like she described with just kind of an aloof indifference uh, kind of ignore those people which that a lot of times i've spoke about this before can kind of be the to the detriment because we should be willing to stand up and say well let's work this out but see you know you may want that but the people here want this and so we got to meet in the middle and a lot of times we just say, well, whatever, you know, I'm not going to worry about it because I'm going to do what I want my way. But all the while, they're changing things. Um, but as I said, not everyone that moves to Appalachia is that like that at all. Uh, I would say most people are not, but that does happen sometimes. So I can really identify uh, with that part of Dory talking about the hotel and how they felt about those people coming. And I'm sure in the same way that I was describing that it's kind of like you need that industry and you need those jobs that come whether it's construction or if it's uh, factory moves or whatever i'm sure that hotel was the same way they provided jobs for those um, local people the natives there that she was calling especially in that time of the depression when they needed those jobs so that was definitely a plus so I hope you'll leave a comment and let me know what you enjoyed from this part of the story. Uh, maybe it was that rabbit that ate at the table. I, I can just envision that in my mind. Um, but whatever it was, leave me a comment and let me know. And I hope you'll come back next Friday because we've got to see what happens next to Dory, Woman of the Mountains.